Emily McDaniel, thank you so much for, for taking the time to join me in, um, as you know, I'm uh, creating this archive. It's a very informal archive of experiences. Uh, I think it's important for us as educators to create a record of what we're going through uh, these really interesting days of the coronavirus. So if you don't mind, um, I would love for you to start by, by telling us a little bit about yourself, your context, the school that you work at and anything else that you might consider relevant for us to know. Definitely, thank you for having me so much. This is, um, this is really great. Um, I'm so glad to give back to both you and CSU Monterey Bay because um, I am an alumni and um, also we're fellow educators. So, um, well, okay, so first of all, um, I am 44. Um, I am a teacher of um, second and third graders. Um, I've been teaching since, oh, let's see here, 2005 now. Um, and I actually went to CSU Monterey Bay for my undergraduate work. Um, I took the liberal studies course. Um, after that, I went to UC Santa Cruz and uh, finished off my education with their master's and credential program, um, and then went right into student teaching. Um, well, not student teaching, I'm sorry, um, first year teaching. Yeah. Um, and I decided that the first school that I'd work at would be a charter school, which was great experience. Um, I worked for a little charter school called Oasis in Salinas. Oh, okay. And I was there for a year. And because I was fresh and new, um, I wanted to experience not just the charter school road, but also the regular public education road. Um, and I worked for um, uh, Gonzales Unified School District for two years. Um, and that was um, you know, completely different style of education, very regimented, here's your textbook, you know, and this is where you need to be and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and while everybody was awesome and very hardworking, it just wasn't my path. And um, everything worked out and my husband actually uh, found a new position in the uh, IT world because he is an IT engineer. Uh -huh. And uh, he got a job with Sutter Healthcare uh, in the Folsom, um, you know, Sacramento area. And so we moved and the school that I found was a charter school again. And I've been there ever since. And I've, I'm such a big advocate of charter schools. I'm with California Montessori Project. And uh, we keep growing every few years. We get bigger and bigger. Um, because we combine Montessori, quality Montessori education with um, Common Core standards mm -hmm. really successfully. Mm -hmm. Everybody's a big family, um, all the educators in the administration and the families become part of our family and it's just a, it's a wonderful experience. So Common Core is uh, exclusive of California. What, what is Common Core? Oh, sorry. Common Core is basically state and um, national standards in the United States right now. Um, and it's what came after the No Child Left Behind stuff. Um, it's, you know, it's got its advantages and it's got its disadvantages. Um, it still does depend upon yearly tests, which some people are against. Um, this year, of course, because of Corona, we have been, um, uh, we've been allowed to not do the tests. Mm -hmm. There will not be any, um, state testing this year. What, and a lot what, of are, what are the years that you're teaching? What groups? What ages? Are currently? Or, yeah, okay. currently. Currently, um, I am what is referred to as a six to nine teacher in the Montessori world, which is second and third grade to everybody else. Uh -huh. um, I teach uh, in a semi-rural um, area. We have a, a higher population of Caucasian students. Um, however, our demographic has definitely changed over the years. Um, which is awesome, the diversity starting 
to become better and better, which I'm, I'm excited for because I love um, teaching all different children. Yeah. Um, we are, I guess, socioeconomically a little bit um, higher socioeconomically, um, um, even though we do have students that do come from some uh, households that are um, not as high economically. Mm -hmm. um, the area that we serve kind of, well, I mean, it's mostly El Dorado County, which is Placerville and um, uh, El Dorado Hills, Shingle Springs, Cameron Park, um, and that that area. It's beautiful country. We just visited recently in Placerville. Yeah. Oh my God, it's just wonderful. It is. It's really great. Yeah, yeah. We also so, serve Folsom and uh -huh. serve uh, a few people from Elk Grove that come all the mm -hmm. way over to our school. Oh. But mm -hmm. we are a charter, so it's a, a school of choice. And That's cool. Exactly. About it, you know, anybody can go in the general area. Yeah. So, so you're you're teaching at the beginning of this academic semester normally, and then yes all this happens tell us the story how did you leave the the whole transition from where you were at the beginning of the semester to where you are right now you know um it's funny we i was having a one of my best years of teaching i think um <laughs> and then this like, <laughs> always happened <laughs> it, it was like oh it was um funny because uh first this year started off beautifully um we had a few bumps in the road in my personal class um, as you do every year with like a few behaviors here and there. Um, but we had gotten to this beautiful kind of familial um, environment in our classroom. We had normalized. Um, everything was awesome. I was looking forward to just going into spring and then summer vacation, you know, with everybody being, you know, uh, very successful. And then bam, this happened. But I have to tell you that, and I don't know if, uh, if there's been a whole lot of study yet, but in this area of California, before the actual coronavirus thing hit, we were hit with some really bad flus in our area that wow. actually really- um, Aggressive. And then some stuff. And we're all wondering if corona didn't come through sooner because, oh. yeah, it was, the fevers were high, they lasted days. We had, you know, sometimes uh, half to uh, one, maybe one third to one half of our kids out for like weeks. And oh it my. cycling through a couple of kids here and there would relapse. Um, body aches were some of the stuff going on, um, nausea. I mean, a lot of the corona symptoms. And yeah. so we, we were experiencing very, very interesting um, symptoms before any, any corona came about. Huh. So that's something to notate too that. Um, that yeah, there was, yeah. Yeah, so when when this happened with Corona, it wasn't like it was shocking, but it was like, huh? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> so. When did it happen? Two or three weeks ago. When did you start stop? Did you did you stop going to school? Yeah, we stopped going to school when I mean, basically everybody. It was announced no more school. Nobody's going in. It was the same time. Do you remember the date? Oh gosh, let's see. Was the 18th or somewhere there? Uh, beginning of March, wasn't it? A beginning. I want, or mid-March, like right around there. I yeah. know, I'll blend yeah. yeah, it. it so it's, um, you're asked by, by the uh, school administration to just stop going to school. So what happened was we um, were asked to get lots of extra work together for mm -hmm. students. Um, one thing, I love another thing I love about our administration is they're really on top of things and they got word that it would possibly happen that we'd stop going to school. So they said, send extra work, 
maybe even put together a little work plan that students could have at home. Yeah. As this might happen, we might not be coming back. When we get back next week, it could be that we don't even, um, we don't even come back. Like Monday, maybe not. So we got everything together for the kids. We sent home extra work. And then by Monday, no, Sunday, I would say, it was announced, sorry, we're not going back. And so right then and there, like our school went into, um, you know, proactive mode and said, we better start preparing for distance learning. And it was a couple of weeks before a lot of other schools did. And so, um, yeah, I, I love our administration. They're really proactive like that. So, yeah. So, so what happens to your classroom? How do you transform your classroom from an interactive face-to-face -face, uh, weekly daily sessions into something yeah. virtual? How do you do that? You know, uh, it, a Zoom had a lot to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> We've had like daily Zoom meetings with our administration and our grade level teams. Uh, to plan this whole guidance administration. Mm -hmm. And as a team, we've put together plans for doing that. For example, um, I started having a once a week Zoom meeting with my class. Mm -hmm. We um, started using our Parent Square program. It's a communication program a lot of schools use. Mm -hmm. uh, and sending lots of emails and messages about work they can do at home to help supplement in this in this time of, at home with yeah. families. Um, and I feel I'm, I'm a parent too. So, you know, it was a lot of emails and a lot of messages. I think those have calmed down now in the last couple of weeks, but just lots of communication one because we're all learning too. This is not something we do on a regular basis. And yeah. so to make everybody feel connected, we've done um, Zoom meetings. We've sent lots of links to PE activities, um, learning activities, anything we can find to help out our families at home feel not alone in all of this. Yes. Mm, you know, it's all about connections. Yeah, I know you mentioned that the, the socioeconomic background of, of your, uh, your students, maybe middle and uh, so we're, we're, I, I'm not sure if we should be talking about the digital divide here, but do you, do you feel like the, the new conditions that we're experiencing right now are burdening the families with an extra way that, they, that it's difficult to, to handle? Are you, are you feeling a pushback from the parents in terms of, okay, this is, this is a lot of a load on us. Uh, so how, how is the relationship with them? Um, yes and yes. So first of all, um, in our area, one of the things we have to deal with is that some people don't have computers and aren't able to get great internet or any because they're in rural areas. Mm -hmm. so we um, researched and provided some links to free internet service during this time. Um, we've also, we have Chromebooks at our school that we use. So it's laptop computers, right? Uh, yes. Were those Basically, given to the students? Yeah, we checked them out. Oh. So anybody who needed them, we provided a checkout service so that they would have a computer. Mm -hmm. The other thing is some families, now they're having to work from home and they might have two, three, four kids. And so having to juggle technology is so challenging. And so having that extra Chromebook or two helps out a lot. Yeah. Um, we also provide paper packets to families um, for pickup outside of the school if they don't have access to a computer. Yeah. I had to be able to, you know, even get internet because of their rural area. I have one student in my class that is out far enough to where there's just no internet. No internet. So wow. they come and get paper packets. I see. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So yeah. The, the big elephant in the room when we talk about uh, digital teaching is, is that uh, 
particularly at younger ages, the, it is the, it is all about the interaction, right? Yeah. So how do you feel? Uh, how how are you uh, keeping a sense of um, how how your students are doing and 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 learning on their own? What do you make of that? <laughs> well, so. I am in a Montessori classroom, and as a Montessori school, we have an extra hurdle because if you are familiar with Montessori education, it's based on using materials, manipulatives, and it's extra hard. So here, um, again, we have the Zoom meetings. Um, we are calling our students and talking to them on the phone and by Zoom checking in with them, checking with their parents, seeing what, you know, they're noticing as far as successes, needs, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, we also provide um, paper copies of Montessori materials that can be cut out and used. Mm -hmm. We don't have, you know, we're not able to send home the physical materials with them yeah. at this point in time. So um, there are also some digital ones online that are free or low cost. Mm -hmm. um, we will be next week, we will be starting a true distance learning program through Google Classroom. Um, our school actually has created a, a whole part of our website, which has a digital work plan um, that students in each grade level can go to and pick what um, we call them jobs. Um, you can say work tasks or um, assignments, basically, uh -huh. that they can do um, language, math, geometry. Uh, we do stuff uh, we call cultural and, and Montessori, which consists of things like botany, zoology, uh, visual art, performing arts, um, history um all that good stuff um so we have all those tasks for daily um daily use and it's very uh, organized and concise um so on the side of the on the work planner you also have um extra learning experiences that you can choose from our school also uses uh something called iReady which is a program that um has math and reading and language uh, practice. So we're also, I think I didn't address this earlier, so sorry. We're also keeping track of students' work through that. Yeah. yeah. yeah it shows you. us how the student is doing in their work and progressing, what they're having a hard time on. And it uh, caters to every single individual student based upon how they assess and how their daily work is and uh what is the class size in your in, in average we have lower oh we have lower class sizes so right now i have 21 students okay so that is, helps right huh that helps the the fact that you have humongous yes. uh, classrooms yeah yeah so, listen we're, we're kind of scary. running out of time and I, okay. I need to keep the clips as short and i want to close without asking you to make a little bit of a reflection for us as to what are the things that you're learning as, a, as an educator, as pedagogist, and, and things that you might want to keep from the current experience. Maybe we're discovering efficiencies that we can apply. Maybe this is forcing us to reconsider some of our practices. So how do you feel about that? Um, I agree, there are some great things. Um, I think the efficiency is definitely something that we need to keep from it. I think the distance learning part is a good thing too, because there are a lot of kids that do a lot better in this world doing distance learning. I think it would be neat for every school to be able to have that branch of their, um, their program uh -huh. and have certain teachers that just do distance learning. I think it would be a great way to, to cater to other students in the area and bring them Montessori education through distance learning. Um, what else? Let's see here. Um, I think that it's good to have this on hand because 
from now on, there could be more issues like this that arise, right? There could be more sicknesses that come up that we need to do this. And if we have it in place, then we're prepared. We it don't, sounds horrible that this could be a new normal, You know, this is the right? first time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, Emily, you, you're, a, you're a teacher, you're a mother, so I can, I can, I can feel that your context is really complicated because you, you have to do your teaching at home too. Yeah. So I want to congratulate you for that. And, Thank and you. I've been congratulating, uh, congratulating every, every educator that I've been uh, fortunate to talk to these days because what uh, you are doing is just, uh, just keeping the most important part of our society going, which is the... Uh, creating opportunities for the next generation so thank you for that and I hope your family continues to be well and, uh, and thank you for your time I really appreciate thank it thank you, you too, thank you for this opportunity alright, take care thank you